outside, I've said this before, but outside of Max Kepler of our opening day lineup or what we would have thought would have been with Irvin Santana, Jason Castro, Miguel Sano, Jorge Polanco, even Joe Maurer spending some time on the DL, Brian Dozier not being you know, his best self, Rosario finishing the year with some injuries, and then certainly with Byron Buxton in the year he went through. We didn't have our group collectively. We had some nice signs. We had some good young players take steps forward, but collectively we didn't take the steps forward we thought we could. So we still believe in that core of talent, but we do know that that needs to take a step forward for us to be competitive. We look at the teams like the Dodgers and the Astros and the Red Sox and the Indians and these teams that have, have been winning for the last couple of seasons. We know there's a gap there that we need to get to, but a lot of that gap has to be closed by the guys who are currently in our clubhouse. And I feel that investing in the development of this group of players, as well as our young guys, as well as the Royce Lewis's and Alex Kirilov's and others, that's how we're going to build toward a sustainable winner for this market. Let's pause here to, to thank our sponsors, Barry Coffee, BarryCoffee.com, and State Farm Agent Tony Hoagland, your State Farm Agent in Champlin. I want to thank Barry Coffee, our long-running sponsor. Go to BarryCoffee.com. Call them at 952-937-8697. You can go to the Kowalskis on Lake Street and just uh, buy something right off the shelf that's down there right off of 35. Uh, they're very easy to work with. Steve Brim is very easy to work with. And I just went and bought some with my, as I always say, with my own money. Uh, no gifts here. I went out and bought my I don't uh, to supply a friend of mine with a Christmas gift. He's a coffee snob. He's going to love this stuff. And we talk about the Bull Run blend. It's not just like Bull Run house blend. There's Bull Run house blend, Bull Run breakfast blend, uh, French roast. They have a bunch of varieties right there on the shelf or right there for order. Uh, we've told you about their micro markets, all the equipment you can buy from Berry Coffee. It's obviously a natural if you, if you run a restaurant, bar, or a cafe, uh, or a, local, a small business, whatever. Uh, but I really like the fact you can go buy it off the shelf if you want to. So thanks to Barry Coffee. Thanks also to Tony Hoagland, your State Farm agent in Champlin, H-O-A-G-L-U-N-D. Uh, again, I work with him by his app, by email. Uh, he's just, you know, by you can call the office. They're just very helpful people. They handle my insurance. They handle Michael Russo's insurance, and we do it because they make it so easy on us. Back to our, my conversation with Derek Falvey. So let's get in on Sano and Buxton. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been... Listen, I've been high on these guys since you guys acquired them. I, I viewed them both as stars. I particularly spent a lot of time with Buxton and think he's a, you know, a, a wonderful young man. But you guys had an awkward ending there yeah. last year. So how do you bridge that? Is, does it even matter? Or is it just the kind of thing that so, sometimes the player is going to be mad at the organization and that's the way it is? Yeah, I, you know, I think you get to the end of the year and there's always challenging conversations. I, I, I've said this before and you know, I maintain this, that – what we want to do is try and look out for the best long-term view of the organization. And we felt that was the best decision at that time for that, for the player and for the team. And we feel now through the off season, uh, Rocco just spent a day with him in Atlanta a couple days ago here uh, and, you know, wanted to make sure that he's in a good place, you know, both physically, mentally, and otherwise, and making sure that he has the kind of off season we need him to have to be the player we know he can be. I mean, you just talked about, he's a wonderful young man, wonderful human being. We care about his continued development. He cares about this market. He cares about this team. I have every expectation, the text messages he and I have had going back and forth around what he's doing now and how he's you know, developing, we feel really good about where he's headed moving forward. Uh, there's no question in my mind. And how do you feel about Snow at the moment? Well, Snow's another you know, good example that I think if we're going to be the team we want to be, if we're being just honest with ourselves, those two guys need to be a big part of it. We know that. As you just said, Jim, these are guys that we've been high on as an organization for a long time for good reason. You know, both very talented players, both very different types of players, but certainly talented. And I feel like Miguel's somebody who's he's got game-changing power potential. We actually know, you know, at third base, despite some of the ups and downs and maybe some of the view of his of his overall um, body, he plays a pretty good third base. He's, I mean, a, he's a tremendous athlete. I mean, he's got great hands. Yeah. He's got a great arm. You know, lateral movement is never going to be the strength of his game, but it's it's good over there at, at third base. So Miguel's been down in the Dominican. Um, Rocco just went there as well on his way out of Atlanta to the Dominican, back uh, back toward home today. But he is. Uh, he spent some time with him. He looks good. I mean, we're getting what we've done is trying to monitor his workout plans. We had our strength and conditioning coordinator go down there, work with him, get the plan set up, and then there are check-ins every seven or so days. And uh, we're getting videos. The, the benefit of technology these days, right? You can watch a workout, you know, literally. Uh, you can see a guy do a ladder drill. You can see him do uh, cone drills or move around. So you can pick up some things, not just around body composition, but you can certainly pick up some things around movement patterns. Like, is he favoring one side or another? Things like that. And then we can quickly determine if there's maybe something off that we need to go check. Well, so far, so good. He's passed all those tests, and I fully anticipate that he'll have a continued good winter. The 
word analytics has become, you know, it, the softest way, but it's become this buzzword. You know, for some people, mm-hmm. it is the holy grail. For other people, it's something that's destroying the game. You know, when I hear you talk about an- analytics, it doesn't sound like either of those things. It sounds like just a way of doing business. I, I, I think that's where the, I wish there was a better way, and this is my fault and others in my seat of better explaining this, because I think that analytics is, um, it's a study of your information, right? And, and an objective way of looking at it. Listen, we all watch games, we see something, we have an opinion, right? And then you have, then your opinion builds upon itself. And then there's an emotion. About. <laughs> there's an emotional attachment to that opinion, right? And then you dig your heels in and otherwise... Well, sometimes there's information that runs counter to that, and you want to at least be reminded of what that is. And, hey, you might still keep your opinion in a certain direction, but you want to at least know, hey, there's some objective way of looking at this that isn't emotional that's helping me understand something. And I think where analytics, there's, there's too much of uh, the, the commentary around analytics versus, right. versus something, versus scouts, versus tradition, versus, I actually think it's all integrated. It's just another way of looking at the, the game. We use analytics in our scouting information all the time. We study our hitting grades historically. We study our pitching grades historically. We study our athleticism grades. How good are we at that? Are we better at that with high school kids than we are with college kids? Are we identifying uh, the right kinds of curveball development? I mean, there are things that you can study using analytical tools or um, and just dive in and understand that, hey, there's something about the interaction between arm action grade and curveball projection that is telling us something that we need to know. And then we can teach our scouts to go look for it. And now we're identifying, from a scouting standpoint, the players that we think we can really help moving forward. That, to me, is exciting. I mean, I, that's part of the game of baseball. That's how you develop. But I think it's, it's, not, it's not going away. It's part of the process. And I think that's going to be you know, the way we need to better articulate how we use it. Well, you have, obvious, you have an obvious fondness for scouts, as do most general managers. No and I think what damaged the reputation of analytics. And listen, I'm a Michael Lewis fan. I've read pretty much everything he's ever written. He's brilliant. But the way he painted the average baseball scout as a slovenly guy who had tobacco juice running down his chin and couldn't operate a calculator. And here you have Billy Bean, who's just kind of this genius mastermind who's operating everything, including right out the deal. I think that really damaged the reputation of scouts. And, you know, most, a lot of scouts I used to talk to when I was on the beat were like Gene Glenn, who's incredibly smart, analytical, and sees everything. Absolutely. And I think that's where Hollywood's Hollywood, right? Yeah. Like, like the reality is that, you know, there's certain ways uh, we can't necessarily control that side of it. I think the key is, this is true of any walk of life, but it's how you treat people, right? So when, I think probably when I came in here initially, when a lot of the scouts in this organization didn't know who I was, or maybe some of the guys that were part of the group, they called different people with the people I'd worked with before, and, and hopefully they heard some decent things about that. But I, I started out in this game, I got into this game by scouting. You know, I scouted in the Cape Cod Baseball League on my own, writing reports on players, trying to blend the analytical tools with scouting information. I have a deep and tremendous respect for what scouts do. It's a challenging job. If you've ever been around a scout driving miles and miles and hotel nights and being away from your family, if you don't have an appreciation for that, then I don't think you should be in this in this game or in, in my seat, certainly. So I feel like the key is really tapping into a scout's understanding about the nuances of a player. It might not be, we don't necessarily always need the velocity number anymore. And so, because we can get that from other systems. What we can't get is what makes this guy tick? How does he, how, when he faces failure, how's he do? So go watch him play basketball in high school and see that he's an average basketball player. He's a heck of a pitcher, but he's an average basketball player. How's he handle with that? How's he handle that failure? Because that's, he's going to fail in professional baseball. How's he going to handle that? And that's where I think teaching our scouts and educating our scouts around how we want to continue to use them and value their information. It used to be that the only way for us to get any of that information around how hard a guy threw was the radar gun. Well, there's more to the job. And I think more advanced scouts and guys who've done it for a long time, they actually prefer that. They don't want to just be number counters. Right. They don't Anybody want to just fill in the box. Anybody yeah. can do that. They want to be able to provide their perspective around a young player and say, I think this guy has more upside and here's why. That's important. Uh, I, one of my favorite pieces I ever did was when Terry was, I think, uh, had just won some big award. I, I did a story on his scouting background, and the stories people told me were hilarious. There was, a, there was one time he was, like, returning a car, like, on a short trip to Chicago or something. Now, I'll probably get the details wrong, but you'll get the point. And he brings the car back to the counter, and they, they were said, oh, well, you had a four-day reservation, and this, you're, you're returning after three days, we're going to have to charge you an extra 50 bucks. And blew Terry's mind, you know, and Terry's cheap. 
So t- Terry's going, uh, no, this doesn't make sense. You're charging me more for less time with the car. And they get in this argument. And Terry says, okay, I'll keep the car another day. And instead of like flying someplace, he ends up putting like 20,000 miles on the car, <laughs> bringing it back, saying, there you go. There you go. <laughs> you save 50 bucks. <laughs> that sounds about right. I, I would tell you, the, the, the traditional scout in, in our game, like they – they could drive miles like it was Ugh. like you were just getting on a plane. It was no big deal. I mean, because they were that's what they were used to. I mean, that was the job for so long yep. was to just traverse the country. I mean, there's a great book, Dollar Sign on the Muscle. I don't know if you've read, read, read that. I'm going way back. It's a scouting book. I mean, it's the precursor to Moneyball that talks more about the scouting side of things. And uh, I remember reading that when I was younger and just you know kind of being fascinated by that idea. And it looked back a number of you know number of years, so it was probably a little less relevant to that moment in time, but. Um, it's, it's a, it's a grind of a job. And I think we have a ton of appreciation for what those guys do in our game. And I don't think we should ever lose sight of that. So on, on the last show, uh, on the last episode of this show, Roy Small and I were talking and we did you a favor. We figured out your winner. We decided that you should sign Nelson Cruz and Cody Allen and, you know, just kind of spend a little of, of your money because we know it's all your money and just be ready to win the division. So we, I thought I'd. Just hand that to you on a silver platter. <laughs> just comment on yeah, that. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think, you know, certainly we went into the offseason knowing with Joe Maurer's retirement, you know, at, at first base there became this opening, and certainly with the way our roster um, transpired at the end of the season, knowing at second base we had an opening as well. So to get, you know, a guy, um, C.J. Crone, who, you know, had a, had a very good year last year, he'll DH some, he can play some first base, you know, clearly has power in the middle of the lineup. That was a good fit to just kind of help us early on at an area of need. And then in, you know, when Jonathan Scope became available, that was a really interesting conversation for us. I mean, if you, if you were to kind of rewind back to the end of 2017 and you think about where our guys were at that stage, well, Jonathan Scope was maybe better than any of those guys. Right. I mean, this guy was one of the better second basemen in the game. Had a tough off season that next uh, that ex off season um, in terms of uh, going into spring training. Dealt with an oblique injury, and for those of you've been around the game for a while, like you have, Jim, oblique injuries tend to hang. You know, they don't they don't really recover that quickly. Uh, and unfortunately for him, I think it tracked him most of the year. Then he got up to Milwaukee and you know didn't play quite as frequently. So we feel like to get a 27 year old free agent who a year ago was on track for you know, a great a great long term career um, after having a little bit of a blip. We hope there's uh, there's a lot of rebound there and. And now we've got a chance with those two guys to really impact the game. In terms of what we're going to do remaining, I mean, there's certainly some guys you just mentioned, too. There's a number of guys still on the board who we think could help this team, uh, certainly, and could help this team now or in the future. And, you know, admittedly, there are some creative ideas out there, too, around free agency, around trade or otherwise, and how that might work with our team. So I just think until until the bell rings in Fort Myers, you know, when you're getting close, there's probably going to be a lot of conversations still going on, and I would anticipate, you know, we'll, we'll be involved in each of those. One more question on that topic. Do you think the presence of Crone and Austin uh, diminishes your need for DH, or would you rather have somebody who's more, maybe more of a sure thing? Well, I think it's a trade-off, right? Because I think there's some uh, there's some long-term benefit of seeing some young players play and continue to allow them to develop. But there's also times where you feel like you have good fits, you know, for your club in terms of you know a really good bat, an established bat, maybe one that take some pressure off other guys in the lineup. You have to think, I mean, it's not just, well, while a lot of it we just talked about analytics is what are the numbers for this player for this year moving forward? How does, it, how does this player impact the player next to him in the lineup for two years down the line? That could be real. And so I've seen that before. And, and sometimes getting on base for some guys is infectious. You see a way a guy takes an at-bat and works it works in at-bat and gets to a place where you know, we're deep into pitch counts with starters and things like that that are really valuable for a lineup. So we feel like there's still opportunity on the board to get guys that could fit our lineup lineup. Now it may displace some guys. That's, that's the tough part. That's the difficult part of the job, but we have to take that into consideration. All right, let's wrap this up. As you know, this is a very loose format. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to either talk about anything you want or to ask me anything you want or to rip me. Now's your chance. Say whatever you like. <laughs> Never going to do that. Oh, no, I would say, no, I, I, I would say, you know, my, my question is, and, and this is more for future uh, questions in general, but you know, we always want to try and be building. We talked about this before building for the now or the future. And, you know, I want to know from, from you or from others that you speak to and you get connections to the fans and voices in the market, how can, how can we serve the fans better in that way? How can we make sure that that's a clear understanding moving forward? Well, and this is something, I, it's a theme of mine, and it's been a theme of mine for a long time. I think, and, you know, I cover all the teams in the market, so I know who does what, who does what well, and where people slip and where people are, have blind spots. I think your organization and and. You know I'm not saying this because I'm sitting here with you. I think your organization does incredible outreach. 
I'm always, I'm still absolutely shocked. You can get people to fly in from the Dominican Republic and Florida. I said this on a radio station in St. Cloud this morning, and and Texas and California, and you get them to. 